Uh, my name is uh, Giuseppe. I'm a PhD student at DTU Electro uh, in, the, in the Energy Systems Operations and Management Group. And uh, today I'm glad to uh, present uh, a demonstration of an aggregation of uh, residential units, a system that is designed here. And um, I speak for also my contributors here, uh, without the help of which uh, this would never have happened. So, uh, big thank to them. <laughs> so, what's uh, the context? iPower, you know, uh, it's divided. I'm sorry, here we have some problems. It's divided in work packages, and the work package, you know, but just shut it down. And, uh, I, yeah. How do we switch this off? Okay. Well, well, I'm sorry for that. Okay. So, uh, the main objectives of the VP1 are the uh, analyze and control related challenges to residential consumption, uh, identify and develop control schemes suitable for supporting power grid flexibility, and investigate the potential of uh, flexible uh, power available in houses and residential customers in general. Um, and the main innovation objectives in this work package are demonstrations of the flex power capability of residential units. So, what are you going to see today? Hoping that everything is going to be all right. Um, because with practical stuff and demo, you never know. You, know. you don't know how long does it take to implement, and you know, at least for the first time, if it will work for real. But we have spent quite much time on it, and I hope everything is going to be all right. Definition of flexibility information model for residential units. So we'll start a bit with how how the, the units communicate their flexibility to an aggregator and which type of information they exchange. Um, we will see how to aggregate heterogeneous types of units via a completely transparent and standardized interface. You will see how the aggregator doesn't care which type of units does it have beneath. It will just use their flexibility to steer the power consumption or production, let's say, of a cluster of units, all connected to the same feeder, to the same point of common coupling, all right? Uh, we'll see the direct steering of power consumption of this cluster, and uh, a, uh, hopefully we end up with, with I mean, having proved this concept for demand response applications. So, the agenda for today, it's a, a short introduction, yes, which we, we're going through now. And then we will just look at the setup, what we have, what I'm going to use, what I'm going to show you. 15 minutes, I will introduce a bit the, uh, the theory behind this flexibility model and the aggregation and how the control is performed. Then 20 minutes, we're going to look, up, look at the demo. Uh, I will explain the, uh, the, the, the visualization and all the data coming and then playing with the system. We'll have uh, five minutes of live play where some of you can just go there and move the, steer the consumption of the cluster. So play a little bit around and then final discussion. So I would, I would like uh, to take all the questions you have at the end. So, what are we talking about? Okay, steering of power consumption. Uh, there are different types of uh, demand response. Okay, you can do it in different ways. There is um, the def deferred consumption. So basically, schedule a unit that would like to consume now or a customer that has <clears throat> power needs now later in the time, if that is possible. Either delta power, for example, some units have the possibility of reducing their consumption and maybe having a longer uh, run time because the consumption is lowered. Uh, we could have scheduled 
consumption. So the unit communicates a scheduled power and then executes that, and that can happen by a negotiation process, for example, or just a posting process to a database. Or the direct power control, where there is no, um, there is no uh, negotiation beforehand, there is no prediction of what is the power uh, being implemented, but the aggregate or the higher level controller just impose a power set point to the units. And then, of course, we need to make sure that this power set point is actually feasible. So we have a, an exchange of information between the units and the, the aggregator or the higher level controller. So what's the setup? Well, we have the flex house that Oliver already presented. We have the e-box that is an electric vehicle enabled for vehicle-to-grid application. This means that it can consume and produce. We can have between 7.5, uh, we have a 7.5 plus minus uh, uh, kilowatts to the grid with this. And uh, a PV installations, a PV installation 10 kilowatts, the one uh, on the side of the flex house. So, of course, we are in November. We couldn't rely much on PV, so I just take the production of that PV and dispatch into our vanadium battery, just to be sure that we have some realistic PV production, but we have it for sure. Then each resource is basically controlled by a, a, an agent. I'm going to, I'm presenting today a distributed control agent, a distributed control system based on agents. Each agent communicate with a what I call cluster agent, the aggregator, all right? And of course, communicates with the unit in order to control the unit. So the interface between the agents and the units, of course, is custom designed and is specifically tuned for the application because every unit has a different hardware, has different protocols, different data you can pull and push. So, but then, from this point, from the unit agent, resource agent called here, out to the cluster agent and to the grid agent, let's say DSO for example, the interface is completely standardized and it's the same. We could have a, a communication directly from the resource agent to the grid agent, same type of information. So what actually does the cluster agent is to collect all the resources from the units, aggregate this information, see what's the capability, what's the power flexibility of the cluster, and then communicate upwards. And then receive a power, the grid agent basically is aware of what is the minimum and maximum power of the cluster. So in our case, negative power is production, meaning that we are feeding power to the grid. Positive power is consumption. At any point in time, we know this P min, P max, and we can decide any point in between to assign, and the cluster will do its best to implement that, all right? So, the, uh, the setup here, we, uh, we see, well, we have the battery connected that is simulating the, the photovoltaics, we have the flex house, and we have our e-box over there, connected to the same feeder, and to the, to the grid. So what we are going to control is the power flow at this point here. So how this, what, what is this interface? What, what's the, the information they are exchanging? Well, a well, few, few highlights. It allows the connection and uh, operation of different systems without modifying the interface in both of sides, okay? It is standardized, so between the resource agents and the, grid ag the, the cluster agent and the grid agent, same type of information exchange. And it is composable, meaning that each uh, cluster agent or the grid agent can accommodate several clusters beneath, and that will work. Um, it features real-time direct power control of microgrids, so here, there is no prediction. We just take decisions in real time. And we can decide to activate the cluster re response. So we can just assign a power set point to the cluster or just leave the cluster to consume 
whatever he wants. So there is an auto mode. Let's say the cluster consumes uh, automatically what is needed. And there is a manual mode where we set the power. Uh, it's, of course, an hierarchical agent-based system. And each the agent speaks for and controls the subsystem. And there is respect of local comforts, which means that every unit, by default, by, by definition, communicating what's the minimum and maximum power, can receive a set point back, which is between. So at all time, we, we, uh, we know that the local comfort of the unit is met. How these power bounds are going to be defined, we will see. For example, um, the, uh, this information uh, interface is, uh, con consists of what I called internal cost function. It's basically a map. It serves as a proxy of the internal state of the system toward the aggregator. It's uh, basically a list of numbers, of floats, that maps a given power set point to a local cost. How much is the local utility to implement a given power set point? So for example, um, uh, so we have a P and, and cost, all right? And of course, the unit communicate an, a, a finite amount of power set points implementable. So if there is a battery with an inverter, for example, that can potentially implement whatever power set point, we discretize that by 200 watts, for example. It's a discrete, it's a discrete function. For example, for um, electric space heating in the flex house, well, what's the minimum power the flex house needs? It is defined by those rooms which temperature is below the minimum comfort bound. So for those, temperature, for those rooms that are a bit cold, we need to heat. So we need that power. We can't give it up. Those rooms are, that are too warm, we cannot heat anymore. Of course, if we're speaking about air conditioning, it's flipped. Those rooms that are inside the comfort region, they actually determine how large is this P min, P max region for the flex house. Simple like that. For the PV, well, since we aim at maximizing the production, the local production, we basically say, well, we're producing this much right now, and there is no, no flexibility. We just produce this. We could implement the possibility to switch off the system, the PV system. So we may have uh, P min zero, P max, what is being produced right now. But uh, in this demo, I, I say that P min is equal P max. So this is my point, only point. And the cost doesn't affect, because there is no choice. So C is just equal to zero. Note that this information is exchanged every 10 seconds. So it's always updated, all right? Um, for a battery, well, like an EV, um, what's our cost function? Well, if we are at low charge, we would like to charge a bit this battery. So um, for high power set point, we have a low cost. We like it. And for lower power set points, meaning discharging, we don't like that. So we have a high cost. So as the battery fills up, the cost the definition of this cost function changes, the shape changes. <coughs> How does it work? Well, the uh, grid agent requests a, a power set point. It could be an initialization set point, whatever, 3,000 megawatts, doesn't matter, because then the cluster agent that has information about the unit state, I mean the units P min and P max, will project that requested power into the safety bounds, in the, into the admissible admissible region, computes which power set point to send to which unit, so optimizes. Let's say we have 10 kilowatts. We want to assign 3.5, 3.5, and 3 to another unit. How do we choose that? Well, it's based on the cost functions, which are discrete. So it's a combinatorial optimization problem. We, re we dispatch the, uh, the power set point to the units. They do their job and they update the flexibility information at the cluster agent, which aggregates that and update up to the grid agent. 
and, the, and we start it again. Yes, I just went through this. All right. So, I think we can uh, start uh, the demo. Yes, pardon? Not yet. Sergeius, is the EV ready? Should be, okay, well, let's, let's wait a second. Let's wait, let's wait. So what are we seeing here? In this visualization, we see um, the internal temperature in the flex house, all right? The, 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 the rooms with different colors. Um, where you see the white is because the visualization was off, so we don't have data, basically. The flex house uh, consumption, negative. Yeah? And uh, then here we see the PV production. We are compressing the, the PV profile one day in 40 minutes. So, so, so to see the evolution, right? We're just ramping up. And the state of charge of the EV, which is not present yet, because we will connect it and we will show how the cluster agent has an auto-discovery feature of the agent. So we have dynamic clustering of units. And units can leave or join the cluster dynamically. And, they will, and their flexibility will be in, put into the flexibility pool of the cluster. And then, uh, yes, the EV power. This is the power meter at the, at the connection with the grid here. And this is our selector for a power set point of the entire cluster, all right? And the red triangles here, they show us what, which are the bounds, the power bounds for this cluster. And they are dynamically updated based on the information that is coming from the units to the cluster agent, all right? And on this side here, we see a bit of the communications between the cluster agent and the various uh, units. And which th the information that is arriving at the cluster agent, the, basically the cost, um, the cost profile, the, the internal cost function. So for example, uh, Flex House is quite warm right now because it has been heating up. I don't know why. But shouldn't be. <laughs> um, can we set to zero the power of the cluster? Yes. You see mode, automatic, manual. So now, for example, uh, we see that our cluster has production capability and consumption capability. And note that now we are producing with the PV uh, some kilowatts, uh, I don't know, it might be eight or something, and we are balancing out with the flex house because we have set uh, zero, the power set point for the cluster. And as soon as the flex house will heat up, will continue heating up, this uh, power bounds, let's say, for the cluster will shift into production because we can't consume. Until we plug in the electric vehicle, Yes, there is an auto discovery of the agents. And here we see the new information coming from the EV. We have updated our visualization with the EV agent as well. And we um, receive the, uh, yes, the EV now is, uh, you see that the, the power bounds have shifted with uh, more, with a larger consumption because we can use also the EV to consume. We can't use so much the flex house because it's very warm. The comfort bounds, I have set them between 19 and 25, all right? So we can actually use part of the flex house because some rooms are too warm we can use our EV. So we can uh, try to, uh, to set to uh, minus five the cluster power. What is, what is that? This? Yes. Uh, 
we just restart the visualization. So this is a good moment for a question, for example. <laughs> yes? Yes, please. <laughs> um, well, uh, yes, I was almost forgetting. Which, which system is running, are running this computer? Linux. And the control algorithms, uh, aggregator and uh, unit agents are written in Python, which communicates with the lower level control units or uh, syslab nodes that, are, that execute the Java. And the communication between these two is performed with XML remote procedure calling. And it's quite tricky. And it's quite tricky and I'm glad we have a nice experts in our group that could fix this, yes. Um, and this is a totally uh, distributed control system because here in the Flex House computer, we have the house agent, right? Which communicates with the cluster agent and actuates the Flex House. But the cluster agent, the EV agent and the PV agent, we have them in another node, the, the node of the aircon wind turbine because basically has a more up-to-date system, new Python version, etc. so it, it was easier to deploy the code. So when you think about uh, uh, implementation, you also need to think of the libraries you have available on your system, the version of the software and all this stuff, and tackling that, it's quite, it, it, it's not trivial. So these agents that run at the aircon node, they actually control directly the computers at the resource. So it doesn't matter where the unit agent is running in the flex, in the syslab. As soon as it is in the syslab network, it can, can talk to the units. And it doesn't matter where the grid agent or the cluster agent run, they will talk to each other in the same network. And then the visualization has its own thread which pull, uh, pulls the information from the cluster agent. So, um, yeah. Let's see. Do we have the EV still, the, the EV still going? Ah, you see the EV left the cluster. So here the visualization updated before it was at around minus 10, the minimum power, now it's shifted. So let's say uh, we want to uh, uh, produce a bit from the cluster. What is point 4.5? Well, manual set. So we're producing something like six or seven. So we should consume uh, yeah, maybe two or something from the flex house. You see that the power at the flex house which is measured directly here from the visualization, so no cheating. This is reading from instruments in the base. Decreased. So we are producing, we sent 4.5, we are giving um, more or less five. We have some, yeah, the heaters are not always the same power consumption, they just vary a bit, uh, so. Um, can we have the EV again? Yes, let's see here if it updates the bounds. Yes, so now we can decide to consume more. Uh, well, even more here. We requested about 10 kilowatts consumption. We, oui. something happened. <laughs> yes, questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, as soon as we can restart the grid agent. Questions for. Yes. Yes. This is a very quick question. 
Why does the fan, fan turn on when you plug in the car? Because it uh, cools down the batteries and the inverter and the inverter. Yes, that's a custom made vehicle. So it, has, it is V2G enabled. And yesterday when we were testing this at 3.50 a.m., 3.30 a.m., um, it was complaining a bit because it was too warm because we have been testing for the whole day. So, uh, so that's why there are fans. Yes. There was another question. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, yes. No questions? Yes. Yes. So how, how many agents have you tried this with? In simulation or in real? In simulation. OK. So um, one, uh, uh, we, we can basically register as many agents as we want at the cluster agent. Of course, as many agents you have, the bigger your optimization problems gets. And my laptop crashes with eight agents. Because uh, given the time I had to develop this, I have a very uh, simple optimization, which is an exhaustive search of the best solution. So it's not scalable in this implementation. Um, it is. Uh, it, it will be very, very interesting to see which methods can we do, uh, can we use to reduce the space of solutions by I don't know heuristic search, and then go and do an exhaustive search in a more near, more closer to the local minima. The problem is that we don't, a, a priori, we don't know what's the shape of the internal cost function, so we. I didn't want to do an interpolation, a quadratic interpolation or linear interpolation because a priori I don't know what's the shape, how does it look like. So I was afraid to get a point that was not the minimum one. Probably by uh, designing a bit more carefully how this cost function is defined, you can do an interpolation and then do a quadratic optimization with that instead of uh, search for basically the, the best point. But yeah, getting back to your question, eight agents in these implementations are enough. Yes. It also depends how many points you have. Because you may have uh, 50 points, and then with two agents, you're basically done. If you have five points per agent, you can have 15 agents, and you're still good. So, yes. Yes? Oh, now it's up and running again. Nice. Um, We send minus 10 to the cluster. Mm -hmm. yes. For example, you see here at the flex house, since it's quite uh, warm, we have a low cost for lower consumption and high cost for higher consumption. And we actually, since all the rooms, I mean, there are no rooms below the comfort zone. We can actually shut it down completely. And there are probably two rooms above the comfort zone, so we can't consume more than eight kilowatts, something like that. We have updated the... Okay, we have sent minus 8.2. Yes, and we are indeed tracking that one. And here we have simulated a fault of the photovoltaic. Uh, so all of a sudden, the production, the local production decrease to zero. Therefore, uh, the, the new equilibrium of the cluster is automatically found by using the, uh, the flex house and the EV. So maybe someone wants to try this 
that's the this is the yeah time for live play. Who wants to do that? Eva? No. Yeah, yeah, come on. Eh? Yes, please, come on. Yeah. With so many engineers, yes. Yes. How do you measure we need to make yes. How do you measure the quantity flexibility? It's not just a question of for how long and how much, it must be interdependent. Uh, of course, of course. This, uh, the definition of the flexibility is done in real time. So of course, if you steer the cluster toward a given power set point for a, at the boundary of the flexibility region, for example, after a while, this flexibility region will shrink, right? So there is, in, in this approach, there is no, um, there is no uh, prediction for that. So you basically do in real time what you can do for, with what you have in the cluster. But the, uh, the, the grid agent, an aggregator, well, whatever entity can decide to use a cluster or dynamically cluster some units and use their flexibility for a given amount of time. And then when it's not needed, when it's not needed anymore, release the units and maybe take other units, cluster them and uh, steer their power. Um, yes. But the, re the flexibility is defined step by, I mean, time step by time step, based on the actual state of resources. And the beauty, well, the, on the other hand, the beauty of this approach is that we don't need any model of the resources. We just need to measure what's their state point. There is no model, no prediction whatsoever involved in this. Yes. Who wants to play? Can we uh, produce something? Let's uh, go on the other side. Yes. Yes, seven. Did you send the message? <laughs> you need to set and then set. Yes, set. And you can verify from our Swiss Lab uh, overview screen here, which also measures from the base, from that the power flow from the grid from above here just changed sign. So and you can also verify the historical production and then this, the history of power exchange with the grid here. When the demo is finished, you have, you're curious, you can observe here. Actually, we don't have a logging of the total cluster power here. Yeah, that's, we don't have historical. Yes, but we have, yeah. Yes. Uh, questions? Wants to play a bit? And um, yes, yes. Nick. Maybe you can comment on the V2G we, we see down there. It's for the yes. first time we can see that the EV is actually producing energy. Yes, mm. by all means. By all means, here we were consuming before, and now we are producing. So we are basically using the EV uh, to uh, produce what we can. And actually, we have limited the power of this uh, EV from minus 7 to plus 7 to just preserve, uh, just avoid the inverter to complain. Uh, so what we actually uh, probably it's minus eight plus eight. So we, we're actually producing with only the, no, it was seven and yeah, 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 yeah. And we are, we're restarting the, the, the photovoltaics right now. What, what was the trigger to start the EV from consuming into producing? What triggered 
Well, the, when we change the power set point for the cluster, the cluster agent, well, the power set point comes from the DSO or grid agent, right? Says, I want plus eight. Then the cluster agent decides how to implement this plus eight. Of course, FlexHouse cannot produce. That's only consumption. Then we have something being produced by the PVs. Therefore, since the PV has no flexibility, then he will assign to the EV the remaining part of production in order to cope with the power received. But it's the, the cluster agent that sends that power set point to the EV. And that parameter is those red triangles, and that's what the, the, the DSO could see those signals, so it knows to yes. ask what is possible. Yes, exactly. Okay. By all means. By all means. This is kind of DSO dashboard. We, we can think about something like that. And actually, this red, uh, this red triangle here, the, the upper bound of the power, is the, uh, is the sum of the upper bound, power upper bound of the EV plus what is being produced by the PV. And you will, I mean, you, before it was a 7, now it's about 10 or something. It will increase as soon as the PV uh, reaches the maximum production. Yes. And we could have three, four, five PVs producing. That's actually no problem because they're internal cost function is just one point, so we can have as many as we want, no problem, and we just balance them uh, with the, yes. So the flex house actually, given that the, uh, the flex house has this shape of the cost function, the, minimum, the local minimum is at the zero, the cluster agent prefers to, to use the EV. Here we are consuming. So we're using both EV and flex house. Yes. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is it uh, correctly understood that it is a static optimization? That means that you cannot tell it to make sure that the battery is fully charged at 7 o'clock tomorrow? The, uh, if we leave the system, if we leave, of course, we, if we are steering manually the cluster, if we ask the cluster to produce power, we will never have the battery charged by tomorrow by fact, um, uh, we will have the battery completely discharged. Discharged. But if we leave the cluster in uh, auto mode, can we set the cluster to auto mode? The, the way the EV or battery agent is programmed is that the minimum of the cost function uh, occurs, uh, well, this cost function um, evolves in order to bring the battery at 75% of charge. So when you release the cluster, we leave it alone, the, the EV agent will just uh, uh, charge the EV up to 75%. And of course, we can adjust this parameter. I just chose 75, so we have a bit of flexibility in both sides. But of course, an EV is meant to be used many times, actually more than the time so you want to produce with it. So we should have like three quarters at least of the battery, yes. I just wanted to, uh, to stress a bit. Okay, this is a, this is a very technical conference. Uh, it's, um, we are demonstrating stuff. We're demonstrating system that are doing what we, uh, what we see in the papers. And uh, what I could learn from this experience is that smart grids uh, are not only made by mathematicians and proof of convergence for algorithms is not sufficient to get this done. What you need is software engineers. What you need is software architectures and architects and uh, standards different languages that can talk to each other because you have different producers of the units with different protocols. So this is, um, 
this is the, 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 the final message I would like to share with you. That uh, it's not only about optimization and modeling. It actually takes a lot of effort, at least as much as making the models and making the optimizer to work, at least as much, to get the real stuff to work. And that could never, ever happen without uh, my dream team, which I kindly ask to come here. Anas Bro Pedersen, Oliver Gierge, Sergeius Martinenzas, Anna Kosek, Daniel Arden, Matthias Vedsen. I want you to see them because they were working, <laughs> yes, without time. Yes, yes. Uh, deploying control algorithms takes time. It takes so much time. Of course, rapid prototyping and simulation, yes, needed. Yeah? But then when you go to deploy these algorithms, you figure out, oh, I share between these agents this type of data with this structure. But then I realize XML remote procedure callings supports only Python native types, not even arrays, it's just lists. OK, so go and debug your code and make it work with that type of data exchange. That's not trivial. Smart grid, yes? Yes. More just a sympathy to understand. Uh, Open Energy is the company, the demand response company of the UK. We have 40 people. We have four uh, PhD data modeling mathematicians. Uh, we have 10 software engineers and about eight controls engineers. So. Uh, the world is not a mathematician world just yet. Yes, yes. But um, the thing is that here you, today you're here, and we are part of Danish Technical University. And we are evaluated. Our KPI are based on scientific publication, of course. Up, up, today, up today, there are, I think, and this idea, I think, is shared among my colleagues, that there are not enough technical conference and technical journals where what you find, to the, the things you find to get the things implemented can be published. Because there are too many people out there saying, well, that's just a matter of implementation. Implementation is very, very, very important. And uh, it is actually an active area of research. Just communication, just infrastructure. It's an area of research. Yes. yes. Thank you.